You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 through 26 in the Christian Standard Bible. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But reject foolishness and ignorant disputes, because you know that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach, and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. In this section of scripture, the writer is just finishing up explaining the importance of avoiding fights about words and to prioritize instead the message that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. After condemning a group of people for preaching a false message about resurrection, the author writes the above scripture. Um, in context of all this, Dr. Trimper Longman the third. how does this section of scripture teach us to disagree better? Uh, well, we got to disagree better by uh, respecting each other and loving each other, even when we disagree with each other. Um, Hmm. And also have humility to, um, to learn from others as well. And sometimes I'll have to admit (laughs) it's really tough to do that when you're talking to somebody who holds a view that you consider blatantly wrong and also maybe dangerous. So sometimes you do have to rebuke, but I think some people are on kind of, um, you know, they're kind of um, um, always ready to be prophetic on people or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But but I, I mean, that's, that's what I've tried to learn over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, that's the so. challenge. <laughs> Yeah, that's the that is the challenge, mm. and um, and and I think the other you know because I, I think uh, bring in the Old Testament here you know you got those two <laughs> verses in Proverbs Proverbs twenty six four and five answer a fool according to his folly or he'll be or or you'll be like him yourself and don't answer her. Oh, answer a fool according to his folly or he'll be wise in his own eyes don't answer a fool according to his folly. Uh, you know, so you you have this, you have to figure out, according to Proverbs, whether even to answer somebody and get mm. into the debate. Sometimes it's wiser just to not engage. Mm. Uh, but when yeah. you engage, you got to figure out who you're talking to, what's the context, all that kind of stuff. Mm. True. Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite series we've done. Um, Man, we're having a blast with our controversial unity series where we're talking about some hot topics in the church today and trying to figure out where unity is possible with these issues. And today, maybe the most controversial, Uh, we're talking about LGBTQ plus issues in the church, um, affirming same sex marriage or not, um, you know, calling people by the pronouns they choose or not, uh, whether transgenderism is a thing even, all these things are highly debated in the church. And uh, for such a discussion, um, I'm Joshua Noll, as always, I'm I'm your host. We we brought on my, Probably my favorite human, at least one of my favorite humans. Um, One of my favorite authors, he he writes a lot lot of really good books. Today, we're going to be talking about one of his books, um, Old Testament Controversies or Controversies in the Old Testament. I get my words jumbled up for some reason. Um, He also is a Old Testament scholar. Uh, You know him. You love him. He's been on the show before. Dr. Trimper Longman III. Welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, Joshua. It's great to be back. But even though you're right, this is a very controversial and difficult issue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and, and we, we couldn't handle it either without uh, without the co-host. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, Dr. Longman's one of my favorite humans, but we're talking we're talking superhuman, um, <laughs> a, a superhuman whose superpower is podcasting, super podcasting. 
mm-hmm. brought to you by your super podcaster, the one and only TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. How's it going, TJ? Welcome oh, to your show. It's going. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you like that, or if you don't like that, which some of <laughs> us are kin to that, uh, you should check out the Honest Owl Ministries podcast network. The website link is below. You can check out shows like ours. Uh, some shows that aren't like ours at all. We just like to have a lot of friends. You can also get on our Discord server and have fun discussions with us. Uh, I might bring up some that I've seen in other Discord servers here uh, just because they're pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, check out our store. I'm fi- I'm finally wearing a whole church shirt. I keep wearing uh, systematic ecology shirts while recording the whole church podcast. And I was like, you know what? What if I wore the right shirt for the right podcast? And today yeah. I did it. Um, if you're wondering, it's just as comfy. And you know, it's pretty simple. It's not overstated or anything. Just yeah, kind of a it's not our logo because that would be too much noise for one shirt, I feel like. So we had yeah, to create a I new do, icon. But it's yeah, cool. I do like that shirt. Yeah. Thanks. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Hopefully someone listening does too. <laughs> um and if you're if you're feeling like this has been too serious of a conversation, don't worry. We have a spiritual practice we like to do on the show where uh, it's actually impossible to be in anything other than unity. You know, unity is um, is inevitable when you're being as silly as I like to be. And today, Dr. Longwin, we've already answered this question. We're asking everyone in this series, what is the silliest argument that you ever remember having? Do you have a you have one that stands out to you? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's silly to me. So um, I was until COVID a lifelong squash player. You know what squash is? Nice. So, yeah. uh, we love a good niche sport. It's it's kind of like racquetball, but that's what the argument was about. You know, it's kind of like uh, some people think racquetball is a better sport than squash. So I've had this argument a couple times uh, in good natured fun, of course. But as I point out to them, squash is like racquetball, except it takes skill. And uh, because the ball in racquetball bounces all over the court, you don't have to move. Whereas in squash, you can place it and the court is bigger and all that. So Hmm. I have to stand out for the elitist sport of squash. But, you know, an interesting thing is squash is only elitist in the United States. In the rest of the world, it's like soccer. You know, soccer Hmm. is, uh, is not a aristocratic sport like it is in the United States where you can only play squash at typically various clubs mm-hmm. but around the world you can play you know, their public court, uh, courts everywhere and it's an Olympic sport this year in Paris for the first time mm. yeah mm. I, I'm looking forward to Olympic squash it's gonna be pretty cool you know <laughs> oddly enough I think that might be one of the the least patriotic statements on the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. America needs to do better with, with specifically regarding squash and how, That's right. how we treat. That's right. It. Yeah, they will not dominate at the other. I think. I think yeah. we bring home silver. Is that that who we vote for? Whichever president is more pro squash. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we determine yeah. from now on. I like it. You know who? You know where the big? You know where the best squash players in the India. 60s, 70s, and 80s? The Pakistanis. Really. Yeah. Why? Now, now, last I heard, it's the Egyptians. So, hmm. you know what's really funny, and we'll we step move up. off of this after this. Uh, <laughs> the same thing. The same thing happened uh, to Tekken that happened to squash in the '60s and '70s and '80s. In 2017, really? like Pakistan started playing Tekken and started dominating. Wow! Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. What a specific fact. Yeah. I'd love to know why you know that. I like Tekken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> see, I, I was thinking it's a uh, for those who watch Adventure Time, we discovered that uh, T- TJ is like the um, I can't remember the name of the character, but he has approximate knowledge of all things. He's never fully right, but he gets pretty close about most things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So before we get too far into this, we, we want to just kind of get out ahead of ourselves and lay out the discussion. Um, so so for this one. Man, that's a that's a big a big ask. But we wanted to uh, ask you, uh, Dr. Longman. You know, there's a lot of different views around the topics we're talking about. Um, there isn't just the Bible says so or the Bible does not say so, right? Like the, the, it's more than that. 
Um, and today we're going to be talking about there's a wide range of like affirming same sex marriage and not affirming same sex marriage of how do we treat transgenderism? Is that even the same issue? Should we use people's pronouns? Um, would you mind maybe just laying out some of the differing opinions that you've heard in the church when it just concerning these topics, like lay out what the arguments are before we get into anything else? Oh yeah. Um, so, I mean, you use the term affirming and one of the ways I would differentiate the different views in the church would be saying that you go all the way from people who are neither welcoming nor affirming. It's a culture war issue. They're attacking. uh, And, uh, and this is a great evil that needs to be rooted out, not only of church, but of society. Okay. So you got that extreme. Then you have those. And I, put myself in this category, the welcoming, but not affirming category. And then there's the uh, welcoming and affirming category, uh, which, and of course, the, the primary issue is, first of all, what role does the Bible play in this discussion? Um, And first of all, uh, is the Bible relevant to the discussion? And secondly, uh, how do we interpret the Bible uh, in on this particular topic? And, you know, in terms of, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've done lately, for various reasons, uh, a lot of reading on the transgender issue. And it's interesting that um, there are, three groups of people who have questions about transgender issues. And it's a, it's an interesting kind of strange alliance between conservative Christians, Catholic and Protestant on the one hand, that's one group. The second group are, are certain, uh, not all of course, feminists uh, are, are very, uh, challenging of the whole transgender. And the other group, what might be a little surprising, again, it's not everybody, but many uh, same-sex attracted people are are um, are questioning the whole transgender thing, partly based on the idea that um, in, in some of their thinking that men who want to become women are often gay men, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and, and the other reason why, and, uh, I read something interesting by Jonathan Rauch, um, can't give you the exact reference right now, but Jonathan was along with, um, Andrew Sullivan and others, part of the thinkers who help, uh, get, same-sex marriage kind of normalized in our society through their writing and thinking. But, um, but one of the things that uh, some like Jonathan Rauch have problems with is that, you know, Andrew Sullivan and, and uh, Jonathan and others were, were trying to make, were, 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 advocating the idea that same-sex marriage is normal, stabilizing in culture, and they weren't kind of attack dogs, whereas transgender activists tend to be very um, polemical, shall we say. So um, so, so I don't know whether it's this, they're, they're related issues to be sure, but I don't think they're the same issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's okay, so... There's a lot with all this. You, you, you mentioned the feminism thing, so I, I wanted to touch that briefly. Second wave and third wave fem- feminism have mm-hmm. definitely addressed this very differently. Um, usually yeah. your second wave feminists are the ones that have more of an issue around this. Yeah. And that's like yeah. um, the things that people hate that J.K. Rowling said, that's because yeah. she really doubled down. And Honestly, it's not just that her view. I think she was also just mean about it, but that's where she's coming from is that kind of second wave feminism viewpoint. Yeah. Um, you, you also, so I'm trying to go through some of the other stuff. Um, 
Yeah, I, I've to me personally, I've changed my mind a lot on these issues in the last just two years. Um, but I've always kind of had the sense that the Bible's a lot more clear on the same sex thing than the other. Um, and, and even though I've changed my view on it, I'm still like, yeah, I I've never understood a lot of the arguments against transgenderism just because biologically we know certain things happen. And that it's not just your male or female. Like we know biologically, you could actually just look at some babies that are born and go, yep. <laughs> you know, like, like there's well, just a, to me, there's always been a common sense thing of, uh, it's hard to deny at least one of these things, you know? Well, um, you know that, well, I, first of all, I mean, we might dive deeper into this, but uh, one of the things that the second wave feminists point out is that that when you know you got to be careful of kind of um stereotyping maleness and femaleness in other words uh because a a a male child is attracted to dolls doesn't Mm -hmm. make them transgender right yeah and then when you get into the issue of intersex which is the most complicated issue um it's very there are very few very 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 few intersexual conditions where the confusion is on the level of genetics you know so they people might have ambiguous genitalia for instance but most of those people are unambiguously male or female on the genetic level and so, I, I mean, I, and again, this doesn't make it <laughs> easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and it's, it's, it's difficult, but, um, uh, and, and yeah. it's, I'm still, I'm, I'm still thinking through the issues, still open to oh, it. Yeah. Uh, and my, my present view to cut to the political issue is, um, I, I personally at this point think that, um, and especially since, by the way, there's an awful lot of data coming in from Scandinavia and Britain mm-hmm. that is saying that the very progressive policies of, say, Denmark and England have mm-hmm. been problematic, you know, that that yeah. they're beginning, they're not beginning to see, they are seeing significant amounts of people who have regretted what they've done as a minor and are detransitioning. But to me, that tells, and America is lagging behind. They lag behind in terms of getting on board uh, and they're lagging behind in terms of recognizing the issues that have arisen surrounding it. So so my, my view now is that we ought not uh, let or encourage people to uh, transition when they're under 18. My own political view is if somebody's over 18, uh, you know, I, I don't think Christians ought to coerce in, mo- in me- most instances where there is uh, political differences, say. I mean, we all agree murder's wrong. Yeah. That ought to be legislated. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and theft, you know. Uh, yeah. There might Something. be a small group out there that's pro-theft or whatever, but, yeah. you know, our, our um, you know, our pluralistic democratic society mm-hmm. um, disagrees on issues like uh, same-sex marriage and transgender issues um so so as an adult i you know i i i think that um that's a decision that an adult can make i would disagree with them i think it is morally problematic but on the other hand yeah yeah and i i mentioned i changed my views i I, i've become more progressive but not I, i think part of the problem with all of these issues is a lot of times it just becomes very polarizing to the extent that yeah. people just act rashly. You right. know, I mean, I mean, a lot of this underage decision making is kind of like, guys, like, come on. And I think it's just in reaction to some people are really mean on the conservative side, too. Right. And they're yeah. like, oh, well, yeah. we want to be accepting. We're going to be so hard to be accepting that we're not even going to think about the consequences here. And you're like, wait, OK, wait yeah. a minute. 
there's got to be a middle ground here. Like, yeah. um, like, like, for example, I think the one that really started changing my mind was a, a case I read about where it was a man with male genitalia and everything who had ovaries. And it's like, OK, yeah, he should have a surgery done like that. That's problematic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 Uh, and it's just kind of a there's more than just what you get told or what's get shouted oh, yeah. at it, both sides. Oh, right. Um, also, uh, one last backtrack, and then I'm going to be done so TJ can do his thing. Um, we, we mentioned affirming and welcoming as terms we're throwing out here when it comes to the same-sex stuff. Um, I wanted you to distinguish the difference a little bit, but I also want to throw out for some people what makes it even more complicated is you have some Christians who are not affirming, but they'll say that people can be born gay and they still should not engage in that marriage. Um, one I'm thinking of is uh, Gregory Cole that we've had on the show before is a good example of that. Yeah. 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 Um... So a lot there, you might have to, but I would start yeah. with the last comment <laughs> you were making. Yeah, I think, I I don't think being gay is a choice, right? I think, I think mm -hmm. uh, we all have dispositions that are problematic from a moral point of view, right? It's, um, uh, you know, I think yeah. probably- Humans are pillars. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, human beings are just killers, like by nature. Yeah, you know, a it's lot of times great. people like to, you know, there are, and there are certain people who are are also genetically disposed, say, to alcoholism or their, and we ought to be, or drugs, and we ought to be sympathetic toward them, but not be affirming of their behavior. We ought to come alongside help and help them. We ought to welcome them, love them. <laughs> but not affirm them uh, yeah. because it's, yeah. So, and then, um, and, and so, yeah. And I mean, uh, I think if most males, at least, and I'll only speak for males were honest, they'd say, you know, monogamy is probably not a inherent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That no. can be but does that mean, and, and, and then there, you know, there are people who are honestly bisexual too. And mm -hmm. so are, are we then going to say, since you have those natural desires by natural, I mean, they're not choices mm -hmm. they're, um, It's okay for you mm -hmm. to sleep with both men and women. Now I don't, mm -hmm. you know, it gets, it gets dicey. Yeah. Uh, look up uh, the natural process of duck mating. That's not OK. Humans should yeah. not do any of those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess oh. they, I, I, saw, I saw something about a about they photographed a male whale having sex with a male whale as, for the first time recently. Oh. And it's like, oh. yeah, you know, OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not all things yeah. natural are, are necessarily right. Right. Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. before we get much deeper into it, um, <laughs> we will be taking a quick controversial detour. Uh, we put every guest in the series and what we call the hot seat. We're going to run through as many of the following questions. Some of them are theological. Uh, some are just pop culture as we can in five minutes. I'm going to choose them at random to try and find your hottest takes or your most controversial opinions. Are you ready, Trimper? I am ready. All right. So what's one thing you thought you would never like that you to enjoy? Um, salads. That's a good answer. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yep. what is one theological doctrine that you've changed your mind about? Ordination of women. If right. you could call that a theological doctrine. Which yeah. It's practic practical theology yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, how important is truth to you? It's very important, especially in this so-called post post-truth society. <laughs> right? Uh, is it more important than love? No, it's not more important, but it's not less important. All right. Uh, do you like? Oh, you go ahead. No, I, that's not, that's it. All right. Do you, <laughs> do you like the movie Titanic? Ah, uh, eh, I wouldn't watch it again. No, it's just okay. No, yeah, it's right. okay. No, so just say so, no. It's okay. <laughs> That's right. So who is, right your, who is your least favorite church father or theologian? Uh, you know, um, there are none that I, well, I mean, I'm thinking 
early church right now. And uh, besides the obvious, like, well, they're not church fathers, the heretics, but uh, I'll just name Gregory of Thermaturgus because Gregory wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes. I'm updating my second edition. Uh, I'm doing the second edition of my Ecclesiastes commentary. And I cite Gregory in the first one, but it just reminds me that he set us off on a wrong foot. But then again, so did Hippolytus on the Song of Songs. So it's a tie. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. So <laughs> rank the Spider-Men, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland from best to worst. I can only give you my favorite because he's the one I remember the most, and that's Toby Maguire. Thank you. Um, All right. The other one's okay, but I like Toby Maguire. It brings a little levity to the. <laughs> yeah, good answer. So, what's one movie, book, or song that you have that you love that no one else does? That I love. Well, you know, I was trying. Mahler, I I love, well, it depends on, you know, obviously if if you know what it is, somebody else besides me likes it, but uh, I'm a big classical music fan. I'll just say Mahler, Gustav Mahler's symphonies. Yeah, that's not a bad answer. Hmm. No one's favorite composer, (laughs) though. What's that? I I don't think that's anyone's favorite composer, so you might be onto something. Yeah, well, I do know at least one other person who's Mm -hmm. Davis Young. Who is a geologist at Yeshiva, and he's retired now, but his father was E.J. Young, the Old Testament scholar. Mm. So he was a big Mahler fanatic. So, what's one movie, book, or song that everyone loves that you don't care for? Barbie. Mm. The movie? Yeah, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I went yeah. not the doll. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> I mean, both could be true. Yeah. 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 Oh, I did like the movie. Yeah. You're right. Uh, so, yeah. is Jesus more important than the Bible? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and the obvious answer is yes, but the real answer is they're both the Word of God. So, and we wouldn't know Jesus unless we had the Bible. So, right? I mean, yeah, yeah it's a trick question. It, <laughs> yeah, the trick. I know. Trick question. <laughs> so, so, you already kind of answered it, but what's the best music? Oh, yeah. Well, it, and within classical, I'm a big opera fan. Hmm. Nice. I like, no one said that All yet. Right. I also like yeah. the opera. So, what is one hot take you have about a cartoon that we may have grown up with? Well, actually, you didn't grow up with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know whether it's a hot take, but I and my wife, Alice, really like fractured fairy tales. Um, hmm. on Bullwinkle. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see a lot of Look it up. Google, Google yeah. it. We got to watch it. fractured with a K. <laughs> ah, so perfect. They're pretty good. Do you have a least favorite Bible verse? A least favorite Bible verse? Gosh. Um, I can't say that I do off the top of my head because... Least favorite might be hardest, like the Nephilim. Least favorite might be the one I don't want to obey, which I'm not telling you. What it is. <laughs> it's actually uh, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's thou shalt not murder. I, I hate that word. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, that's least favorite. I could. How about uh, the speeches of uh, the three friends of Joe? That oh. gets me off the hook. Yeah, yeah that's a whole bunch. <laughs> Good answer good answer mm-hmm. i forgot mine but it's really long and really annoying <laughs> uh, but hey we did i can tell you i can tell questions. you what the, my least favorite biblical characters are do it <laughs> sure i'm, I'm curious now, now. I'd, I'd start with paul okay wow okay and and then secondly nehemiah uh, hmm. in other words All i right. like you know they contributed of course and i yeah. to the word of god but I don't want to have drinks with them in the celestial bar. Yeah, yeah. When I go up there and I, I find the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what, whatever pubs or uh, breweries God's got going up there. I, yeah. I hope they don't visit the same time I visit. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Oh, man, that's funny. All right. That's all of them. Yeah, yeah. I don't have we Have we done them all? We've done Once. them all a few times. Yeah. yeah. Or twice. All right. So we want to uh get get it kind of into 
how we can disagree. So, so we have our questions are kind of more around the ability to, to, to disagree more than just what we believe. So I, I want to ask, how sure are you um, about your views when it concerns same sex relationships, transgender mm-hmm. issues and the stuff that we talked about earlier? So I, you know, and I, for various reasons, um, I have put a lot of thought over the years into this uh, issue, and I'm pretty, I'm very, um, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty convinced of the not affirming part, and I'm also very convinced of the welcoming part, but where, where I think we need to do a lot more thinking and working and talking is what does it mean to welcome? You know, mm, I mean, yeah. there's certain obvious answers to that. You love people, you engage them, you welcome them into your, you welcome people into your churches or into your groups. But then what happens if somebody who is not just, I, I think it's a no brainer if somebody chooses a celibate lifestyle that, you know, you welcome fully, you know, yeah. uh, people can not only join the church, but be pastors and elders and all that. But the difficult question comes, um, and it's a, it's a difficult question in different types of churches, too, because yeah. membership means different things in different churches. So, yeah. So how, how would you answer that question? How would I answer that question? Yeah. I'm still working it through, and I have the luxury of not being a pastor. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> I, I uh, you know, when I was writing Old Testament controversies, I sent it off to some of my pastor friends, and uh, I I don't think he'd mind if I mentioned, uh, I mean, he, he recently died, but you know, I sent it to Tim Keller and who's been a long, who was a long time friend of mine. Um, yeah, I love him. And, um, and I was floating an idea of membership and he said the problem with that for, you know, his PCA church was if somebody was in a same sex relationship, that person would come under discipline, you know, in the Presbyterian system the day they became members. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I think Tim also knew that there were people within his church who were sleeping together without being married. And and the common rejoinder is, well, what about those people? And he said, I know it's happening. I just don't know who they are, but if it comes (laughs) to my attention, then I am going to, we're going to approach them pastorally. So, so um, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't, you know, Tim's position on same sex relationships is public and well known. So I, I don't think yeah. anybody should be surprised that he said that. And Tim himself was somebody who was very loving and welcoming. He had really close, uh, gay friends. Matter of fact, this Jonathan Rauch, which I mentioned earlier, he's, he's a Jewish atheist, uh, gay man who, Loved him. Mm-hmm. I saw it, saw him at uh, Keller's memorial service. He wrote a mm-hmm. very beautiful eulogy for Tim, um, talking precisely about that. That this man, even though I knew he disagreed with me, I also knew he loved me, kind of thing. And um, mm-hmm. and so um, and and of course, you may know that Tim has come under heavy criticism over the past oh, few yeah. years from a certain group that thinks that this is not the time to be nice to non-Christians. We got to, you know, we got to engage in culture war. And I find that, I find that disturbing, that attitude. Yeah. So speaking, speaking of the culture war, uh, should Christians respect people's chosen pronouns? Yeah. You know, um, I, I think they should. I think that um, there's an interesting back and forth between Preston Sprinkle and Rosaria Butterfield on that point. And 
I um, again, it's related. PJ, you're right. It's related to this issue of are we just going to engage in polemics and alienate ourselves from people, or are we going to respect them? And are we going to uh, allow for you know express our 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 respect uh, for them as people and honor their uh, choice. Um, so I, I am kind of on the Preston Sprinkle side of that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. So oh. mm-hmm. no, TJ, maybe I should, what I typically do, and I have been in these situations, I have actually taught in contexts where, you know, you have the zoom and you have the, they, them, um, and, uh, my, my strategy is just to avoid pronouns. <laughs> that's, mm. that's, you know, yeah, and, and, that works. And you could, you could do that. You could do that without drawing attention to yourself. And that's probably, that would be my first impulse for better or worse. That's what mm-hmm. I would do is try to avoid pronouns. Yeah. I often have just started using the they pronoun because yeah. it's usually not offensive if you do go by he, you know. Yeah. yeah. They seem safe. Yeah. Yeah. But so are, are you open to being wrong about your views on same sex marriage and transgenderism? Absolutely. I actually I <laughs> I uh I would almost like to be wrong about <laughs> uh to be honest, because A I um, I would, um, you know, I'm, um, I don't like telling people that they can't, well, maybe I shouldn't explain myself any further, but I do not relish the idea of, of saying, look, the Bible doesn't affirm this desire that you have to be in a intimate relationship with a, another human being. Um, what we're asking of people, mm-hmm. I think we need to respect is, is a deep sacrifice that I don't have to make myself, right? Yeah. Uh, there are other areas in which I have to sacrifice, but I, um, and it, you know, it's not just same sex people who, who make that sacrifice either voluntarily or involuntary. I know plenty of single people who would love to get married too and it's just not working out for them and it's Mm -hmm. different but similar in the sense i think one of the things that people rightly point out like sam alberry um is that we who's a gay celibate minister um Mm -hmm. sam makes the point that one of the things that we tend to do is make sex kind of like uh found you know we we elevate it in importance in our lives it's important it's mm, yeah. it's a big part of who we are we don't want to deny that god made us sexual beings um but yeah it's not as if if you're not having sex you're somehow not a full can't be a fully flourishing human being <laughs> yeah yeah. In fact, uh, a lot of our biblical heroes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, so, so you're, you're bringing up a, a lot of different ideas. Um, and, and, you know, part of why I wanted to have you on is because of your book, you know, con- uh, confronting Old Testament controversies. Uh, and and w- one thing you did there that, that I really like, you went through some of these hot topic things, much like we're doing in this series, but, you know, throughout the Old Testament as an Old Testament scholar. And, you know, you mentioned you you went out to Tim Keller and you got his perspective. You also, um, one of your good friends, a good friend of our show, actually helped us start the series, was up Pete Inns. And you yeah. had kind of his view on this in your own book and kind of confronting it with why you don't agree with him and that kind of stuff. I, I feel like you did a really good job. And I, I love that. I love that you're able to reach out to both sides. And I want to get your, te- uh, your advice on how we can do that better. But, you know, you were mentioning how we, we elevate this issue. And I think that's the thing that really concerns me is it's almost become like the church's primary thing is yeah. what are you doing with your genitalia? And then after yeah. that, we're going to tell you about Jesus. Like, wait a minute, why, why is that the number one thing? And I feel like if Jesus was here today, 
the trap the Pharisees would lay for him is, okay, well, you say to be welcoming, but they're in sin. So how do we, you know, like, I feel like that would be the trap question. And here we are elevating this thing that isn't even the gospel. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then there's the other side who feels like they have to elevate it. And it's like that polarizing effect in the gospel is kind of getting lost in all of this. I feel like. Um, All I can say is you're exactly right. I mean, it really, uh, uh, amazes me that church bodies spend so much time um, going after this issue when the bigger issue in most of those churches have to do with other forms of sin, like sexual mm-hmm. abuse or domestic abuse or um, Greed. any number of things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. One so percent of the population, I think, uh, wrestles with transgender issues and definitely yeah. more than one percent of our sermons talk about it. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it is. It is interesting and, and disturbing, but it fits in with this, as we've been saying, the whole culture war thing. I, I kind of like the uh, term culture care that Mark Laberton, Pete yeah. Wainer, um, and others have been using to say, you know, but, and again, it doesn't mean that we're not going to come into conflict with people, but I think, I mean, one of my um, principles, and principles aren't always <laughs> consistent, but is unless somebody's forcing me to sin, um, I don't feel it necessary to coerce them not to sin when they don't think it's sin kind of thing. Yeah. The only reason, the reason why I'm against transitioning under 18 is I just don't think kids that young are capable of making that radical a decision. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, um, especially in the light of the fact that there's now all this evidence we talked about earlier that such a policy was problematic. Mm -hmm. So I do think government has a role in protecting us in certain areas, but yeah. Um, but I think legislation ought to be kind of like the last, well, the last, last resort. <laughs> last yeah. resort. Cause it backfires, right? They overturned mm-hmm. Roe yeah. versus Wade. And I heard recently there were, there've been more abortions since then than before. Yeah. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you're just not going to legislate yourself out of an yeah. issue and yeah. that and if there's a national ban on abortion i will guarantee you there'll still be plenty of abortions in the united states it will just be the rich and middle class that get them yeah, yeah. a lot of people don't know uh the year before they reversed roe v wade there was uh more wait, less abortions than uh, yeah. the year before roe v wade was actually <laughs> initiated so yeah, and they're the well, the other really interesting. Wasn't. The other interesting, uh, uh, and I'm not sure why this is the case, but you can look back, and there are significantly fewer abortions performed under Democratic presidents than Republican ones. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely interesting. So how? And it you- may be partly because you know they're they're more Democratic administrations tend to mm-hmm. push for more sort of social safety net issues. So people may feel more comfortable having children than if they think nobody's going to help me. And the church certainly hadn't done its job. Yeah. 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 So how were you able to work with people on both your left and right to discuss your perspective on these issues in biblical texts? Um, Well, I, I, well, maybe you mentioning Pete uh, and, and, uh, (laughs) You know, it's it's easier when they're your good friends, <laughs> and yeah. and and you don't alienate them, or they don't alienate you because you have disagreements. Now, Pete was my student back in the day. I'm the one who encouraged him to go into Old Testament and wrote the 
reference letters to get him into Harvard. <laughs> so, <laughs> and yeah. then I hired him when I was teaching at Westminster. Uh, I was chair of the department. And so I recruited yeah. him and we taught together. And then I left Westminster in 98 when I saw things were kind of changing there. Yeah. And uh, he stuck it out and uh, said something to me like, I'm a rat leaving a sinking ship. But he said it with a chuckle. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, but we we were just very good friends, and I respect him deeply, and I know his heart too. That makes it easier. I mean, his heart is for God, for Jesus, and you know, I think one of the differences, and I won't say this about Pete, but I started at a different place than Pete and others. Pete grew up in a more conservative Christian context, yeah, where. At some point, I think he and others saw, well, no, this isn't really what the Bible teaches. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. on the other hand, I grew up in a very liberal church where, ah. <laughs> where, the, um, where I realized they're making no actual faith demands on my life here. <laughs> yeah. And then when I was in high school, a Baptist minister came along and shared the gospel with me. So, oh, okay. so I, I kind of move from a more liberal um, yeah. environment to a more evangelical. What I, I, I describe myself, maybe too complimentary to myself, as a generous, centrist, <laughs> evangelical. <laughs> mm. You know, that that's, uh, that's close to how I was describing you to my boss, because uh, she hadn't read any of your books. And I was like, oh, oh I'm right. about to record this podcast. I was so excited, and I was trying to, like... <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I, I did use the word centrist. Um, yeah. Old Testament yeah. scholar. I'm like, yeah, I was trying to trying to get there. You know, everybody has well, different the, the generous part is I try not to demonize people to the right <laughs> and left to me, even yeah. when I disagree with them. Yeah. But I will tell you hard in today's culture. I will. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, it's actually I, at least I found it harder to um, be generous toward the right, especially the extreme right. Yeah, because they're they people in that theological spectrum can be dogmatic and opinionated. Or and less generous. So I have to yeah. I, I have to kind of watch. No, it's watch myself. Um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So we we kind of made three main distinctions. If we're gonna just transition to just focusing on some of the same sex marriage issues of whether. You should be welcoming and affirming, um, not welcoming, not affirming, or welcoming and affirming. I don't think there's such a thing as not welcoming and affirming. <laughs> we affirm what you do, but right. please don't come here. <laughs> yeah. I don't think yeah. that exists. Right. You can that's be gay right. out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, away from us. Yeah, I don't think that's a. I don't. It could be. I don't know. Yeah. But um, with with those three main views, uh, and you say you're more in the welcoming not affirming, what would you say are the two biggest or some of the biggest weaknesses on the two other sides, in your opinion? Well, I think the biggest weakness on the on the affirming side is the consistent biblical testimony. I think the mm -hmm. biggest weakness yeah. on the non-welcoming side is the tendency to demonize people who are created in the image of God and not understand um, that we all struggle with uh, sin that engenders a certain humility. So, and that uh, as I read the new Testament, at least I see Jesus welcoming sinners um, and, yeah. and approaching them. So, so I think that's the, biggest weakness on that side hmm. yeah hmm. good answer so we are asking every guest to try their best to make the best argument they can against their own position if yeah. you had to make an argument for the biblical case in support of same-sex relations how would it go how recently well, so, have you talked against, so this is against my position yeah okay i don't think i don't think I can make a biblical argument against, I know all the biblical arguments against it, or at least I, I've done as much as I can to 
argue to to <laughs> discover those. And I I survey them in that book, confronting Old Testament controversies, issues like you know Romans one is talking about pederasty, or uh, you know in the Old Testament there are just two case laws there, and who pays attention to case laws and. So, uh, but I will make, I will say probably the biggest, uh, but, and, and I, and I would also, before I go to the, <laughs> to the next comment, I, I will say that I think it's actually significant that the fact that nobody read the Bible in an affirming position, as far as I can see until about 30 years ago, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Now, I read the Song of Songs differently than they did in the Middle Ages, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is allegorical. So, so there's um, there's a. Um, I'm not saying that it's never the fact that we just discover a new <laughs> meaning yeah. of a text uh, thirty, forty years ago that no one has ever seen. But you, even even back in the Middle Ages, there were people who said, yeah, it's really about human sexuality. Uh, so you have precursors. And I'm um, there. You don't have that. So that, to me, is raises the bar for making a biblical argument. Now, I, the biggest struggle I have, and I'm sure some listeners out there would want to tell me what the moral harm <laughs> is, but... No. I think it's really hard to talk about uh, moral harm of same-sex relationships, a married, stable, same-sex relationships. You know, mm-hmm. if you ask the question, what harm are they bringing to themselves and to society? Um, that's a hard argument to 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 make. So I I struggle with that, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at Adam and Eve. I mean, what, uh, and again, I think it's a figurative depiction of a historical reality, but, you know, what's the real harm of eating this food off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Mm-hmm. Well, the harm, so I, I guess what I'm saying, they didn't know what the moral harm was. Yeah. They just knew God said, don't do it. And so, unfortunately, that gets you to that position that's often parodied. The Bible says it. That means God said it. So that ends the discussion. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and that's where, f- for me, I think I find arguments like uh, like what Pete Inns makes a lot more compelling than arguments that like Matt Vines makes, for example. No. Where, you know, Matt Vines still tries to kind of use this inerrancy model and say, oh, actually, right. Scripture is right. talking about this. Whereas Pete goes, yeah, I don't believe in inerrancy. Here's the trajectory of scripture, yeah, and here's right. where I am at now, acknowledging mm-hmm. that is what the Bible says. I just yeah. disagree with it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. that's that's right. That's what, what I, when I said early on, uh, kind of depends on what your view of the Bible is. First of yeah. all, and then <laughs> secondly, then secondly, interpreting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, a lot of different ways I, to get there. Yeah, so I and I disagree with. Pete in his view of the Bible um, yeah, in that way. Um, Which I think you address that in the book as well. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. I do in relationship to the divine violence thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So because Pete takes the view that um, the way the Israelites actually picture God is not the way God actually is. Mm-hmm. So. I actually disagree with Pete some there too. <laughs> yeah, my my problem with that approach, and I've talked to him about this and haven't convinced him, he hadn't convinced me, but we still love <laughs> each other. It's uh it's the fact that um, you know, if we sort of pick and choose what we like in the Bible <laughs> or what we think is right, I mean that that's problematic to me. Um uh-huh. so um but then yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So how is it possible to have unity with other Christians we don't agree with about this? If we can't agree on what sin is, how is unity possible? Well, it, again, it depends on what you mean by unity, too. Um, I, I, 
I, I think we can have unity by focusing in on Jesus, okay, and reminding yeah. <laughs> ourselves that we both, uh, you know, love Jesus and that it's not our views on same-sex relationships that uh, save us. It's Jesus on the cross who saves us, right? Mm, so um, I think we need to keep in mind what is truly important. But within that, and then respect each other and try to engage with each other respectfully and honestly, you know, um, and um, and at least that's the way I um, I try to do it. And I don't do it successfully <laughs> all the time. Yeah, man. Right? Good stuff, though. So we're, we're asked, we always ask everybody at the end of our episode if you had to provide a tangible action that would help engender unity in the church, what it would be. And we're trying to be more specific here and specifically around these issues. So for those who have a hard time reaching across the aisle for people who, you know, usually it's, you know, your conservative, your progressive camps are kind of where this issue falls, right? And sometimes we have a hard time reaching across that aisle. What do you think specifically people could do that would help them better reach out? Ah, well, again, I'll go back to a theme I've hit two or three times, which is simply to act like people are actually created in the image of God. (laughs) You know, uh, that every time you interact with somebody, remind yourself they're created in the image of God. Um, I have a great quote from Calvin in uh, on that subject, uh, which was picked up by an Asian theologian, um, and I, I, I should have looked it up again, but it basically in terms of the application, he said, not only should we love the prostitute, we should do the harder thing and even love the pimp. That doesn't mean you don't, um, you don't uh, arrest the pimp or do whatever you, within your power, but you don't demonize them, which, yeah. which by the way, <laughs> as an aside, is my biggest problem with a certain part of the church when it comes to immigrants. You know, it's like yeah. there is no no justification for the type of demonization of a whole class of people like immigrants um, like we have seen in our political situation today. Yeah, I think the most helpful or maybe shocking answer i've heard a question like this uh, i was listening to a podcast um i think it was on better faith by guest not really sure but uh they asked the question of uh how should christians treat the other or what are, what are, how mm-hmm. are we treating the other something along those lines and the answer given was we need to get rid of the term the other <laughs> and i was like ah well <laughs> here it is the question <laughs> is wrong yeah 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 i mean in the sense that we're all creating the image of god there are no others right yeah. We just construct others. Um, we create that category. So I could see where that person was coming from on that topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So when we start looking at everyone as being made in the image of God, what changes? What do we see happen in the world? Well, and, and notice I said not just see, but act like they're created in the image of God. And what that means is, you know, we respect them. We listen to them. We uh, sometimes that means we correct them or teach them. Um, but but it's not just a mental state I'm talking about. It's a mental state that leads to concrete actions. So what the world would look like would be a lot nicer. <laughs> lot, well, nicer. <laughs> yeah. You know, nice isn't always great, right? But what I mean is, it would be a, it would be a place where, you see, I, at least my experience is, if you approach people with a lack of respect and dignity, then you're alienating them. And even if you're right that they're wrong or acting incorrectly, they're not going to listen to you if you're just yelling at them. Um, and, um, and so actually, if you want to, if you want to affect change in people, treat them with 
respect and dignity as you point out the truth, getting back to that truth and love mm-hmm. question. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So before we wrap up, we like to ask everyone to share a moment where they saw God mm-hmm. recently, whether that be a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, curse, whatever it may be, whatever God laid on you. Uh, I always make Josh go first to give the rest of us enough time to think about what they want their yeah. God moment to be. Uh, so, Josh, do you have a God moment for us this week? I'm thinking. You don't. Oh. You don't get that. Can, can I? Can it? Can it be like a a secondary God moment? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I, I my brother received a, a, a blessing mm-hmm. that I am um, that I, I secondhand am happy about. Uh, he got a new puppy. <laughs> I love dogs. So just, uh, you know, seeing the puppy and, the, you know, just thinking about, you know, Copper's going to have a friend. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just excited. I'm excited. Uh, little things sometimes are pets just fill me with joy, uh, as does all of God's creation. And, you know, it's spring. So you're starting to see life outside. And that kind of just gave me like that little mm-hmm. boost of uh, ah, puppy, new life. This is going to be great. <laughs> you know, so in my mind, that's going to be how uh, spring started this year was my brother getting a puppy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. nice all right i'll go next uh yeah i do think that counts as a god moment just because it's not you doesn't mean it's not god uh but yeah for me my sister moved into her new house their new house a little family mm-hmm. uh we've been building the house for the past year uh, the shed's been robbed you know mm-hmm. they've been well, through it all living out of a trailer uh, but the house is built they're moving in and it's great it just right. feels so nice to to you know be seeing the fruits of a massive loan and a huge commitment. Mm. Both have secondhand you know? blessings to this this yeah. go around. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah, well, so, um, yeah, there are a bunch. I like the I like the spring scene, the spring idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here in Washington D.C. where some of the cherry trees are blossoming already. Well, the not the, not the ones down at the uh, mall, but, uh, we live about 20 minutes from where the, the famous cherry trees blossom. So we'll go down there. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I was going to talk, be a lot more spiritual than you guys and talk about this sermon that I heard the other day, but I want to say, and we see them regularly. We moved here to Washington, DC to be close to our, uh, closer to our kids and our grandkids. So six of them live in the area and it's just a God moment to see them running around our house, especially since I can see them run around the house. I could come up to my office and work while my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Praise God. Good stuff. We love that. So please consider sharing this episode with a friend, share with an enemy, um, share with your cousins, if they live around, uh, do it in person. Uh, also, if you're listening on the AMP Network YouTube channel, hit like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell, just so you know. Get a little heads up. Uh, you can leave a comment. We'll see that like whenever. Uh, so if you're just leaving YouTube comments at 3 in the morning, thank you. Uh, I'm better at checking YouTube comments than other comments. Yeah. yeah. Or emails. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the Amazon Ministries Podcast Network, also check out the network itself. There's a website in the show notes. You can go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can find a like single stream or the whole channel. All the different shows there. Uh, the Homily with Will Rose, My Seminary Life, Brandon Knight. L- lots of good stuff. Many good things. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we're going to have Andrew Fouts and Joe Day on the show to discuss differing views about politics coming from the pulpit. After that, we're going to have Thomas Ord on to discuss the continuation or cessation of gifts of the Holy Spirit and also maybe the Ord stage this year at Theology of Your Camp. And finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. What? He yeah. doesn't know yet, does he? <laughs> no. Uh, I didn't think so. Someone really needs to tell him. It's It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs>